Hello, I'm John Abbott, the producer and editor of a nostalgic oral history shell font. Episode number five is about Forest Park. A lot has been written about this well-known amusement park, but I think you will really enjoy the unique movie film clips and photos of inside the park. Hello everyone, my name is John Malak. I'm the chairman of a nonprofit organization known as the Friends of Forest Park and I'm here today standing in what was once part of the original park. Now the park's history goes all the way back to 1835 when it opened as Eckert's Grove and the property was owned by George Eckert who was a wealthy farmer and miller and he and his son inherited the property from Simon Butler all the way back in the 1720s. And it continued as a picnic grove with uh, rowboats and steam-operated amusements in the later years following the Civil War. Um, and it was those years later where Isaac Funk and his family purchased the property and it became known as Funk's Park. In those early days, we have postcards and a lot of photos of picnics back at the park, the rural kiddie rides, and the Funk family owned the park all the way up to the 1920s. It wasn't until the early 1930s that the Lussie family expressed interest in the park. The Lussies were known for building what we call the bumper cars. And it is in those years of the 1930s and the 40s and the 1950s that Forest Park experienced a boom in business with picnics as, as many as uh, 30 or 40,000 people, especially during World War II when a lot of defense plants had their picnics at Forest Park. Uh, I spent most weekends growing up in Chalfont, but in the summers I was dropped off for at least a week every summer until I had my own children and I never understood why that was happening. But there was a fellow in town named Doug Woodall, who was my age and the, the son of a good friend of my aunt's. And we hooked up and we would go out to Forest Park before people came in. And Doug knew a lot of the ride operators, so we were allowed to get on the rides so they could test it, and if the crowd started to show up, we were supposed to show great enthusiasm so that people would know this was a great ride. We never paid for a ride out there when I was there. Hmm. Forest Park was a gold mine. Now, I realized there was a ride there called the Salt and Pepper Shaker. <laughs> it was two, car, two cars, two slinger cars, on either end of a shaft, pivot in the middle. And this thing spun, and as it spun, the carts rotated. And what that did was shake all the money out of everyone's pocket. So we would go down early on the week mornings, weekday mornings, before anyone got there, and get inside the, the fence of the different rides and collect nickels, times, and quarters, which is how come I know so much about the Bartleson, Bensinger, and the other candy store because we were flush. Because these people would come in the week, not week afternoons and, and weekends and holidays and, and get the, the hell shuck out of them and all the change out of their pockets. They realize it. They're screaming for the life of the salt and pepper shaker. So we, uh, we, we down there collected our, our booty. Our With the Lussies adding more rides, they had also uh, attracted entertainment. There were several groups of, of musicians. Uh, probably the most common group was the Philadelphia Mummer String Band who actually had competition at the park at the closing of each season. Uh, there were also visits from Hollywood actors and actresses. Uh, Marlene Dietrich, Mae West, the Three Stooges had all made appearances here at the park. And there were always surprises. And in one year when Harry Truman was running for re-election, he made a surprise visit to the park. It wasn't until the mid-1950s when there was uh, some problems that uh, 
had slowed the park business down. One was an amusement tax that was levied by the local school board on the large picnics, which basically meant that your picnic, you'd have to pay an additional tax to a local school board. With many of Forest Park's uh, customers coming from out of town, they didn't see why they would have to pay an amusement tax to a local school board that they had little to do with. In 1955, there was a flood. Uh, there was actually two hurricanes that uh, came to the Delaware Valley and did a lot of damage and to the park and, of course, to the whole local area. Uh, the park was actually under eight feet of water. But the park made it through it that year and kept going, even though they had to spend money to rehabilitate the park and buy and repair several rides. The, the biggest issue that probably led to the closing of the park was in 1958, on opening day, Memorial Day, there was a race riot at the park, and the National Guard were on standby as, as several state police districts uh, emptied out and came to the park and closed it down for the day, and there were over 20 persons who had to be admitted to the hospital. Yes, I was working the Penny Arcade. Can you uh, briefly describe what happened? Well, evidently it started on the dance floor, and it just, it just escalated really quick. And they started throwing those glass, back then they had glass soda bottles and they were heavy duty. And uh, they used them as missiles to throw at the people. And uh, they ran up, a, a whole group of them ran up to me and asked me to help hide them somewhere. So I left them go upstairs in the Penny Arcade where that's where they kept the supplies, toilet paper and <laughs> for the park. And uh, yeah, I said, don't say it. When you get up there, I said, don't say nothing. I mean, my God, just keep quiet until the police come. It took a while for the police to come. It was all state police that came, Dublin, Warrington, from all over. Well, and then everybody just went every, in every direction they could, and that was the end of it. Uh, they just uh, spread out. And the, the people that were the victims, the, the blacks at the time, I mean, they had to get back on their trains and buses. Oh, my God, it was a mess. They were all up in here in, in town, too. And a lot of the townsfolks took them in to, uh, you know, help them out. That was real nice at Chalfont. Um, actually, I was, uh, I was living in on North Main Street up near the water tower at the time and my in-laws were up visiting us for the day. We did not really realize what had happened but uh, they were they were going home on the train uh, to Philadelphia and we took them down to the station and uh, these uh, black people were coming, running, frightened, carrying, screaming uh, to the train state to get on the train. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we really didn't know what it was. And then finally we had turned on the news and, and, and heard about it, that it, it was there. Uh, we also learned later on that uh, they, they had, uh, uh, it was a, a, an excursion the, the Reading Railroad had brought this uh, sorority, I think it was, uh, up to, uh, and their families and friends up to Forest Park. There was a siding there at Forest Park, and uh, the trains were on the, were parked in the siding there. A lot of them ran to the train to get on the train for protection, and um, the whites that were attacking them uh, followed them and started throwing uh, rocks and stones through the windows. The windows were all shattered, and um, it was um, it was not a pretty sight. Also, I, right down the street, um, I had, as I mentioned before, I had a friend uh, named Chester Lutz. We were buddies, but the house next to them was right. Uh, as, 
at the beginning of a path that took you up over the railroad and, and into the park. And uh, so some people ran down there and this oh, one man was banging on the door trying to um, get into the house and, and uh, tell them that there was someone that was hurt, very badly hurt. And, uh, you know, get in, to, trying to get help for, for the person that was hurt, not for himself. But uh, it was a, uh, a very uh, scary time for the people that were in the park. Excellent. I worked at the French fry stand during high school, and uh, we, they were the best French fries you could eat. They wouldn't be able to do it today because we fried them in peanut oil. <laughs> so that would be a no-no today because of people with allergies. But we always had vinegar and little cruets on the counter because the Philadelphia people apparently put vinegar on their French fries. And as I said, we had the, uh, uh, the uh, cotton candy too, but that we couldn't spin on, on humid days at all. I think they used to have dances in the hall like um, at one time way back. I know during the, uh, right after World War II, they, uh, there was a big celebration, a whole week-long celebration uh, for the ending of the war. And I believe out there in that big hall there was uh, different things going on during that week at night and all. And all oh, that hall was also used by St. Jude's before they built their church. St. Jude's met out there, had their church out there in the hall. One of the popular items at the park was the park swimming pool. It was an Olympic-sized pool, and it was 75 by 150 feet, and it was quite an attraction, one of the largest pools on the East Coast at the time. If you look at the photo that we have here, you can actually see the park swimming pool just on the edge here of Route 202 and Bristol Road. It had several bathhouses. Um, there was parking right in front of the pool. Oh, well, Forest Park was uh, a really uh, a great summer pastime for all of us kids. Um, particularly the pool over at Forest Park. We, uh, uh, we used to be able to get a season ticket to the pool, which we could swim as often and as much as I want. I remember the first one that I got was, I think, I, I forget now how much it was. It wasn't much, maybe 15 cents or something like that for the month of August, right before it closed and I could pay it off of a nickel a week. And uh, so that start was my start there at, uh, at the pool, but that's where I learned to swim and I learned to dive. And, uh, uh, and the pool had like, uh, you would check your clothing. They had these changing booths. Um, like cabanas? Yeah, well, it was all in a row and they were open like at the very top. They had a section for women and a section for men. And you were given a bag uh, that was like a, on a hanger to put your clothes in. And then you were given a, a little metal like on a strap that you would, were supposed to put around your ankle or your hand to claim the, bank, the bag later. And um, she worked that. And then she got promoted up to the restroom where her sister Jack, older sister Jackie was working. And Babs told about how she was serving hot dogs this one day and, and sodas, and she went to get another box of hot dogs out of the refrigerator, and when she opened them, there was all moldy, and she took them back to Mrs. Lussie. And Mrs. Lussie said, just wash them out in the soda water. <laughs> Babs said she thinks that's why she never ate hot dogs after that. <laughs> but that was her promotion to work up in the restaurant. Um, I can can't think of, I, oh, I, I know I never had membership because it was always work to do on the farm. During the week, there was not much going on in Forest Park, but on the weekend, uh, he had a lot of picnics uh, there. And uh, particularly in the spring, uh, the, a lot of the schools in Philadelphia uh, would have an outing at the park, and uh, you know they would bring the children up there. And uh, that was, the park was busy at that time. 
uh, on the um, also a lot of the companies uh, had their company picnics there at Forest Park, and uh, they would be on the weekends. Um, Heinz Manufacturing from Philadelphia was one. The Bud Company, which made um, automobile bodies, uh, parts for automobile bodies. Uh, they would come up, uh, I do remember them. The park did have a baseball field, actually several baseball fields, and they are also on this photo, uh, the photograph, and they're probably in the location that I am actually standing right now. Um, and, and that was right next to the bowling alley and the Penny Arcade and the Chalfant Auditorium where there were several events that would go on as you booked your picnic, one of the one of the many things to do. Alvin Moyer mentioned as a boy he used to he apparently had a, a small bowling alley and he used to set pins. I think he said it was for 10 cents an hour in ice cream. There was also an attraction at Forest Park based on the legend of Forest Park and it was called Frontier Town. Uh, the legend is that uh, that they had buried Chief Tamanin at the confluence of the Pine Run and the Chamonix Creeks. With, with, the, with the legend of the Indian and the very common theme of cowboys and Indians at the time, that became the, the center focal for Frontier Town, where the Forest Park Miniature Railway would run out to every day, about 20 times a day, and there was always a surprise train robbery by Chief One Star, who was an actual employee at the park at the time. And part of the fun and curiosity was you never knew what train he was going to rob. <laughs> but Frontier Town opened in 1948, and that stayed open until the closing of the park. And it was basically a Wild West remake. This area up here is uh, Frontier Town, which was built in 1948. Uh, there was actual picnic groves even beyond that. And, uh, Chief One Star would also take the kids around all the time on arrowhead hunts, uh, tree identification, animal footprint identification, and, and tell them in Indian stories, legends, and lore. It's hard to imagine when you tell folks that the picnic business was, was the big business here at Forest Park. And they did have as many as 30 or 40,000 people here. Uh, one of the examples is the Bud Company picnic, which had their picnic several times at the park. And they were a big uh, defense plant contractor who had auxiliary plants. And they had over 30,000 employees who would basically come in and take over the park. Uh, that was one of the larger picnics. Um, there were over 15 picnic groves, and if you, if you ever get a chance to walk around, uh, as I mentioned at one point, there are a lot of remnants of the picnic tables and benches still around. And once you start counting and start doing the math, you'll see how they were able to accommodate that many folks. In 1964, that was the last year that any picnics were booked at the park and the park officially closed in 1966. But we were always in the pool. High dive. Took years for me to go off of that though. It was big. It was just a bunch of us. We just swam all day long and just played. And then, <laughs> then a little later we would stop I guess we would get out, and lots of times we'd just walk over to the uh, amusement park and go on the rides. And the rides, if we did pay money, it was not a lot of money. But most of the time, I think we, they just let us go down. We, we would come home with burning eyes because you swam so hard all day long. Place to meet boys? Oh, absolutely. First boyfriend there. It was just a good life to not have to do anything but play and swim. We just went and had fun. Yeah. And that's how we got our group together in Chalfont. And we stayed together probably up to 10th, 11th grade. Made well, good friends for the rest of our life. But we were um, 
just plain happy kids back then. Yeah, and then we would uh, just have fun swimming all day. And that was it.